Patrick's breastplate, or Lorica. And that was composed, tradition says, legend says, that was composed one Easter vigil evening when Patrick uh, was on at Tara on the hill and the Druid, 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 excuse me, the Druid priest had forbidden any fires to be lit. And Patrick said, it's Easter Vigil, and what do, what do we do except when we have a pandemic? We light a fire. So Patrick lit a fire. And the king sent all his noblemen out to catch Patrick. And Patrick was at Tar Tara. When they got there, they couldn't find Patrick, but they found a small herd of deer. And that's why this prayer is called the deer's cry, because they only could find the deer, and, and that's how Patrick escaped. So just a little bit about Patrick's life. I think you probably know a lot about him. We've got a picture of him right up there. See our window right up there, right up here, with the, with the uh, red background. And uh, he was not from Ireland you probably already know. He was from England, Britain, a Gaul at the time. He was captured as a slave to be taken back to Ireland. The Irish people were very uh, ferocious, and they took him in, held, held in captivity as a slave for a number of years. And thought for all of us. You know, we have people who hurt us, we have people who injure us, people who enslave us in many ways. And Patrick went back to convert them. He went back to take the good news to them. So he went back and became the first bishop of Ireland. And this was uh, in the uh, 400s. So there's a lot of myth about Patrick. Uh, somebody said he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. There's no truth to that, or at least no historic proof to that. Uh, it said that he was, a, he was a stranger in a strange land when he came. He did not know the Celtic people. And uh, a lot of times the, the sources I read said, we like to make him into this plaster saint, or <coughs> as I say, this little green guy carrying a shamrock drinking beer you know that's our that's our image of patrick today that's what's being celebrated out on the streets tonight with all the saint patrick's day parades and with all the the specials and all the special meals and all that but to get to the to the root of who this man was and the kind of saint he was he uh, he was filled with humility and strength and that strength that we often don't see in the biographies we have of him uh, the first obstacle that Patrick faced when he went back to England was he was not well educated. And the six years that Patrick was enslaved in Ireland put him permanently behind 
his peers educationally. So he always was behind, even though he got named bishop and he had all these great accomplishments. Educationally, he was behind. Uh, it was hard for him to speak to the people, but he did because he felt that, that call. This commentary, it was an article from St. Uh, Anthony Messenger, it said that he was a patron saint of the excluded. As a result of his enslavement, Patrick grew into a man that he truly would not have otherwise had become. So you would have to say that Patrick's kidnapping was a great grace, not just for the people of Ireland, but for all the people of Western history. His captivity left him with a hatred for slavery. And he would later become the first human being in history of the world to speak out, speak out unequivocally against it. So he, having experienced being a slave, he spoke out against it. And I think that's always interesting that we don't really think about Patrick as, quote, a patron of the abolitionist movement. It said, the papacy did not condemn slavery as immoral until the end of the 19th century. But here's Patrick in the 5th century saying this is wrong. This is wrong. It shows an enormous insight and courage and a tremendous fellow feeling, the ability to suffer with other people and to understand what other people suffered. And he wanted to go back to those very people that enslaved him and bring good news. He's really one of the great saints of the downtrodden and the excluded. The people that no one else wants anything to do with were the very people he went to. He was a mystic, and it talks about, um, at the beginning of his letter uh, to Corontichus, he talks about living with, that, with the barbarians. And, and this, they think he probably maybe might have, could have written this. You know, something like that. But he talks about spending all night in prayer. All night, day in and day out in prayer. Um, he said, I do not overreach myself for I have had to play a part in it. Those who he has called to himself and predestined to teach the gospel in the midst of considerable persecution as far as the ends of the earth. And so he talks about going back to proclaim that gospel and praying day in and day out. This is a book called The Confessions of St. Patrick, which um, you could probably pick up anywhere you look for. And so Patrick took back that, that sense of hatred of the enslaver, but wanting to convert them, wanting to end this evil. And so he left a lasting legacy because we know that Patrick converted Ireland and then when the dark ages came in Europe it was the Irish who preserved the civilization they had the book of Kells they had the scriptures they had actually when we talk about reconciliation which we just talked to Randy about it was the Irish who developed the, the reconciliation as we know it today which is kind of a, a uh, marriage between good spiritual direction and getting your life straightened around and reconciliation and that also so Patrick introduced the Irish to Christianity and then after the um, what we used to call it we call it the invasion of nations when we went to school it was the barbarian invasions but now it's the invasion of nations and the dark ages it was the Irish who went back to the mainland and brought back and converted them. The Irish see the faith thrive in an, in an entirely different environment, in a culture that celebrates rather than abnegates nature. And uh, that leads me to the next point. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Patrick, but a couple things about the Celtic spirituality. The Celts were a group of people 
the first time they're mentioned is 500 BC. And they're mentioned of the historic record of Celts in Europe. And it was 250 BC before we find anything about the Celts in Ireland. So they started in Europe, across Europe, and then they came over into Ireland. Celtic Gaul became part of the Roman Empire in 53 BC. And it was in 432 when Patrick arrived in Ireland. So the fifth century. Now the Celtic spirituality if you notice, I said 500 BC, 250 BC, 53 BC, that's all before Christ. So it was a spirituality that was, was more universal than when Christ came and focused on Christianity. And so there are some characteristics of Celtic spirituality. There is a powerful sense of the supernatural world life beyond death. The Irish call them thin places. There are places that we cross over from this world to the next world and back to this world and over to that world because it's thin. It's the supernatural is right here with us right now. Some of those thin places would be like the edge of the ocean where the water comes in and meets the sand and goes back and forth. It's a thin place. When day becomes night, when night becomes day, those are thin places, places where God can touch us. They, because of that, they felt God was near at hand. God was around them all the time. We talk about the imminent presence of God, but to the Irish, that was just the way they lived. The sacredness of earth, water, woods, hills, was all holy. And when I took a, a workshop on Celtic spirituality, uh, there were a couple of us that were Franciscans there, and we kept trying to say, you know, Francis caught a lot of this in his sense of nature, of God's imminent presence in everything. And that's very much part of the Celtic spirituality. They had a high value placed on learning and literary expressions and music and telling the stories through rhyme, through poetry. And we think of, of Irish people today, and you always think of the, the Irish jokesters, the, the songs, the poetry, the singing, the, the, the Irish music, the dancing. That was all part of their culture that became part of the Christian view of the world. Uh, they also had this monastic spirituality after Patrick. And the monastery was not just the way we think of the monastery, the Sisters of the Visitation. The monastery was like the whole village. The monastery was in the middle, but there were people all around, and there was a, a sense of hospitality always at the monastery. We find this in the Benedictine sense of hospitality as part of that, that monastic living. So the first thing in this Celtic spirituality I wanted to just mention is uh, the imminent presence of God and how God was present all around them everywhere. And here's a prayer, uh, and you probably caught some of that in that deer's cry prayer. But he says, God, this is a prayer, God with me lying down, God with me rising up, God with me in every ray of light, nor I a ray of joy without him, nor one ray without him. Christ with me sleeping, Christ with me waking, Christ with me watching, every day and night, every day and night. God with me protecting, God with me directing, the Spirit with me strengthening forever and forevermore, ever and evermore, amen. Look at that, that sense of God lying down with me, rising up, sleeping, waking, watching, every movement, God was with them. God was forever present. They continue 
Bless to me, O God, each thing mine eyes see. Everything I see, bless it. Bless to me, O God, each sound mine ears hear. Bless to me, O God, each odor that goes to my nostrils. Bless to me, O God, each taste that goes to my li lips, each note that goes to my song, each ray that guides my way, each thing I pursue, each lure that tempts my will, the zeal that seeks my living soul, the three that seek my heart, the zeal that seeks my living soul, the three that seek my heart. Think of that sense of God always present. And, and every verse and, and word that they said, um, every action dedicated to God, a woman's work in the kitchen, a men in the field, God is intimately involved in every action. Journey is a time for them to walk with God and for God to walk with them. Of course, they would, would always walk, and God was with them. I on my path, O God, thou God in my steps. Bless to me, O God, the earth beneath my foot. Bless to me, O God, the path where I go. So as people took their sheep to the fields and left them under God's care, when they went out fishing, they prayed. When they went wherever they went, there were prayers for planting. It said a man would walk around, in it, uh, walk around in the direction of the sun and sprinkle the ground with clear cold water in the name of the Trinity so that the sowing itself could begin on a Friday when the corn was ripe enough to be cut, the whole family dressed in their best, and the father would take out his sickle, face the sun, and cutting a handful of corn would put it sunwise three times around his head. The sense of the Trinity, the sense of God, every single thing, that imminent sense. And that's part, uh, an integral part of Celtic spirituality. And we find it all the time. Um, there's an interesting custom at the time of birth. The infant was handed across to fire three times carried sunwise three times around the hearth. Then the mother would place three drops of water on its forehead and beseech the Holy Trinity to lave and to bathe the child and to preserve it to themselves. You notice the three, the three, the three, the sense of the Trinity. Everything is done three times for the sense of the Trinity. There was also special parting prayers and even bed blessings. For the Irish, life was lived simply and carefully, but always in the presence of God's all-encompassing love. Now, my great-grandmother came over from Ireland, and we don't have many Irish traditions when I grew up, but Mom always used to say before we go to bed, four corners on my bed, four angels lie and spread. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God bless this bed that I lay on. Now, as I read all these Irish things, I'm sure that's where that came from. Four angels on my bed. That protection, that imminence of God. Um, it, it's words are, were a matter of partnership with God. This is the way God was here as I blessed everything. Every single thing was blessed. God was alive in the stranger, in the friend, and in themselves. And this is interesting. For the Celts, the world was not dualistic. This is the big plague that we have as Westerners. We think dualistically. We think right, wrong, right, left, up, down. But the Celts did not think dualistically. It isn't the good and the bad. It's we're all just together. We're all just together. They believed that there was a, a membrane that separated the world from the unseen. I mentioned that earlier. They called those thin places. There were, there were connections between seen and unseen, 
a place where it was possible to touch and be touched by God. Angels, saints, and the dead were in the thin places. No wall, no dualism, we're together. Uh, I just think of what, what would our spirituality be like had this spirituality been more prevalent in our world, this, this non-dualistic thinking, that we're all in this together, and we do it all the time in our world today. You know, we, we think Republicans, Democrats, drives me crazy, you know? The Democrats can, pre can present something very reasonable, and Republicans will vote against it because they're Republicans. The Republicans put out something reasonable, and the Democrats vote against because it's dualistic. It's we can't be together. And yet the Celtic spirituality was very much together. Other thin places, oak trees. Now, that was interesting to me because, remember, it's Boniface who chopped down the oak tree in Germany. And the Celtic people way, way back came across from Germany. And the Celtic people in Germany thought that the oak tree was where God was. And so when Boniface chopped it down, he said, no, that God's not there, God's everywhere. But the Celtics felt oak trees were very sacred. Hilltops, because you're closer to God on a hilltop. In monasteries, places associated with Patrick, Bridget, or Columba, locations where people have died were considered thin places. This membrane between us and God is so thin, just moves back and forth. Irish were a people for whom God was a thing assured, true, intelligible. They feel invisible powers before them, by their side, at their back, throughout the day and throughout the night. So this whole sense of the imminence of God. They also had a deep, deep sense of creation. And they were not creation-centered, but creation-filled. We are all part of God's creation. The earth was part of God's creation and is a mother goddess. Now we know that because in Ireland they had many megaliths, which are large stone structures, and you've probably seen some pictures of these, circles of stones. There are 1,200 such monuments. Standing stones, stones in a row, stones in a circle, built at the same time as the pyramids. Uh, and we're not, not sure a whole lot about them. When I was in Ireland, I saw some. They don't know how they got those stones there because the stones weren't from that area. They brought them in from somewhere. They drug them in. But these were sacred. And God's presence was understood as sacramental. We would call them sacramentals. We talk about that. They saw everything. Everything they say, heard, felt, connected them to God. If God is present everywhere, so is all of creation and the spirits. The perception of the holiness of the earth and the sacredness of matter belong to the world familiar to them. What they recognized in the world they saw was the dwelling place of God. Everything spoke of God. They didn't worship the world. They worshiped the creator of the world who was present. They knew the universe to be alive. Religious universe was not static or dead, but dynamic, living, powerful. Universe reflecting a power which comes from God. Everything is created in an orderly fashion, with harmony, and humans have a place and a role in the created world. And that knowledge of God's creation all around us led them to be people of awe, delight, and gratitude. And again, I think that what we know today as that Irish sense of humor, that Irish sense of dance, sense of joy, sense of celebration, um, even we think of an Irish wake, it is not like a German wake, not at all, because it's a celebration, it's a celebration. 
Everything good comes from God and is to be given freedom to be itself, to enjoy and be enjoyed. There's a sense of common creation, and this I think Pope Francis picks up in Laudato Si, our common home. We're all in this together, folks, and God is here with us in everything we see, and as the Celts say, everything we hear, everything we touch or taste, it all connects us to God. When we cut ourselves off from the world, we are in poverty. Sorry about that. Okay, so that's a sense of the, the celebration of creation. They said, a world which has lost its vision of the sacredness of creation has also lost its commitment to the dignity of human life. If we lose the sacredness of creation, the giftedness of creation, then we've lost the sense of life itself. And this is St. Columbanus. Understand, if you want to know the creator, know created things. Understand created things if you want to understand the creator. St. Bonaventure said that the first sacrament is creation. The first book we read is creation. It's the gift of God. Bears, wolves, animals usually hunted were shown as warm and gentle in the Celtic mind. Their delightful stories reveal a mutual love, trust, and sympathy with animals, with created things. Think of that famous uh, uh, story from Isaiah about the peaceable kingdom where the bear and the lamb will lie down together and a child will lead them. That's very Celtic. <laughs> That's what the Celtics would believe, that it was a common creation and the world, the inner world, is as large as the outer, a world without walls and without frontiers. And that's a, a bit about the creation sense of the Celtic spirituality. These thin places where God is just present everywhere. God's strength and power is right here, right now. We can just touch it. We take everything I touch or taste is in God's power. Now, the other thing we know, there are some other elements about Celtic spirituality, and that's the cross. This is, uh, this is an Irish, high, what they call the High Cross, and uh, it has on it, on, on one side, it has uh, Jesus, actually Jesus is on both sides, uh, the crucifixion, and then lots of folks, all sorts of folks, and um, this was, was from Ireland, from uh, one of the monasteries there, Monastery Boyd's, and where they have a number of these, but these are found throughout all of Ireland. It's believed that the circle was because the Druids believed that, that the sun was God. Because remember the sun, we, we need the sun to live. Without the sun, we're, you know, we need the sun. And they recognized that. They recognized the, the movement of the earth around the sun, although they probably didn't know that what was happening. But they knew that there was something going on with that. So they worship the sun. So it's believed that when they put these crosses, they put the sun right on it to say that Jesus is, this is this marriage of this concept they had of the power of sun and then the son of God. So this is just a, a high cross, a, a sample of it, not very high. I guess they're about 30 feet high. Um, I'm going to write a book here. So the Irish people understood suffering also. And they understood that, that life was, was an ups and downs, that there was this uh, Paschal mystery. And if you just think of the pan, uh, potato famine in 1848, which if any of you have Irish blood, probably that's where, how they got over here was the potato famine. 
The potato famine almost decimated Ireland, adding yet another dimension to the extreme suffering of the Irish people. And here's a poem that was written by William Drennan, and he crystallizes the anguish of the Irish people in these lines. Hapless nation, rent and torn, thou were early taught to mourn. Warfare of 600 years, epics marked with blood and tears. Hapless nation, hapless land, heap of uncemented sand, crumbled by a foreign weight and by worst domestic hate. Here we watch our brothers sleep, watch with us, but no, not weep. Watch with us through dead of night, but expect the morning light. And so even in the midst of all of this suffering, it ends up with expect the morning light, or as the motto of the uh, Christophers, it's better to light one little candle than, than to curse the darkness. So the connection between suffering and creation is something that early peoples knew as an essential part of their lives. You plant a seed, some seed grows, and some seed does not. Or it grows, and then some uh, act of nature, some storm, some hail, something can destroy it. That nature is cruel, uncertain, and menacing. This is a fallen world, and that's part of the Celtic spirituality also. And so that's why we have these high crosses, uh, often with pictures of Adam and Eve sharing an apple, or maybe St. Anthony, Anthony and Paul. And Anthony, of course, was the, uh, the Egyptian uh, monk who uh, the, was in the, the hermit in the Egyptian desert. The crosses do not speak of optimism but hope. I thought that was interesting. Not optimism, but hope. In the Celtic world, there was a sense of sin. Tears were prayed for, freeing, cleansing. A sorrow that makes for healing that leads to joy. And the Celtic church knew it well for its emphasis on penance, but does not give us a gloomy Christianity. Repentance makes for joyful living. And so uh, Randy over here is getting ready for his first reconciliation next Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And it's not to bring oppression, guilt, but to free us for joy. And so the Celtic Church well recognized that. And on page 129 here we have a little prayer that recognizes that. It says, according to the multitude of your mercies, cleanse my iniquity. Now think of the creation spirituality here. O star-like sun, O guiding light, O home of the planets, O fiery manned and marvelous one, O fertile undul undulating fiery sea, forgive. O fiery glow, O fiery flame of judgment, forgive. O holy storyteller, holy scholar, O full of holy grace, of holy strength, overflowing, loving, silent one, O generous and thunderous giver of gifts, forgive. O rock-like warrior of a hundred hosts, O fair-crowned one, victorious, skilled in battle, Forgive. Isn't that beautiful? Just forgive. You know, we don't have we don't have to grovel, but all this beauty and all this magnificence around us, just forgive. Unless we appreciate the deeply ascetic strain that runs through Celtic Christianity, then we can't really understand the Celtic tradition. They had three martyrdoms: the blood which was red, white, which was the peregrinatio, which was the pilgrim, the, the penitent, the one walking on a pilgrimage to make up for their sin. And then they had a, that was red, white, and then they had a blue one, 
which is a life of austerity, denial, and repentance. And that was martyrdom. They also had three Lents. Before Easter, it was called the Lent of Elijah. Before Christmas, it was the Lent of Jesus. And after Pentecost, it was the Lent of Moses. Now, we're used to one Lent, but I know in, in reading um, the life of St. Francis, and of course, Francis lived in the, uh, in the 12th century, 12th and 13th centuries, there were several other Lents. There was the Lent of St. Michael, that was a big one in the fall. And then, of course, the Lent that we, we celebrate before Easter. But they had other Lents. And so the Celtic people had three of them. And uh, they fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays. And that tradition had went on for a long, long time. And then it was reduced to just Friday Lent uh, fasting. But I know when I first went to the convent, we didn't eat meat on Wednesdays, or most Wednesdays. Um, and the sacrament of reconciliation, as we know it today, finds its roots in Ireland because they had what, we, what they called um, anacarum, which is a soul friend. So your anacarum, anacarum, which is, means soul, and that soul friend reminds us that God is the ultimate soul friend but it is as though he has helpers along the way. So God has soul friends for us. And those soul friends help us stay interconnected and interrelated with one another and with God and with the world as we see it. The life of suffering and repentance finds its most dramatic expression in these high crosses which appear all throughout Ireland. And they were a reminder all the time of God's great love for us. They sh show Christ as reigning from the cross. The O could be the globe, although they didn't know the world was round. So I think it is more the uh, sun and the creation, the circle of creation, the circle of redemption, and it might be co connected to the pre-Christian era of the Druids worship the sun. Every church had a cross near it, which was used for daily prayer. And the cross was a focal point in the countryside because it claimed the land for Christ. Truly a statement of belief in the possibility of a transfigured universe. So having these crosses all over. Now, again, that in, in Italy, when I was there, they had little chapels all over the place. And those of you who have been to Italy know that. Um, San Damiano was one of those little chapels. But there were others, and they just, people would build them, and they'd have a little household chapel, and then they would go into ruins. But these were all constant reminders of God's presence. Sometimes it was the crucifix on one side of these, of these crosses, and it was the resurrection on the other. Now this particular one has the crucifixion on both sides, but some of them had, had that. The cross was also viewed as a tree, and remember that the tree was a very holy image, the oak tree, a, a thin place, it's a place where God grows up like a tree. The crucifixion was often described in detail, but took on a cosmic air. It seemed to be that the, uh, the whole cosmos is offered in that. I'm not going to read all this here. And the cross of Christ about us. That was a traditional Irish saying. The cross of Christ about us. It, in, it was always invoked in time of trouble. Our whole lives are under the care of Christ and the cross. And the Celtic prayer was with the body, it was kneeling, it was genuflecting. Cross prayer was prayer for the body. It was always prayed to, as a reminder that God is so near us. Here's one of the prayers uh, about the cross. At all the time, it is through the victory of the cross that protection is sought from the forces of fear, evil, and distress. And so the prayer, may the cross of the crucifixion tree 
upon the wounded back of Christ. Deliver me from distress, from death, and from spells. The cross of Christ without fault, all outstretched toward me. O oh God, bless to me my lot before my going out. What harm soever may be therein, may I not take thence. For the sake of Christ the guileless, for the sake of the King of power. In the name of the King of life, in the name of the Christ of love, in the name of the Holy Spirit, the triumph of my strength. So that whole sense that of the cross is, is integral to our understanding of the spirituality, the Celtic spirituality. Seen in creation and seen in the life of Jesus. Uh, what I, I wanted to do, about time here, if, if there are any comments or any sharings you want to do, and then I'd like to end with uh, that prayer that we saw at the beginning, uh, but we would pray it uh, together. So any comments, any thoughts, anything resonate, anything you want to think about when you get home? Anything mean anything? Very interesting. Thank you. Thin places? Mm. Yes. For those, those watching at home, Adrienne is a nurse, and she said she felt that sense of thin places when she was with someone who was dying and who was, was of the world and not of the world. They were here, but they were not. And probably many of us have experienced that being with someone who's in the process of passing over, as we say, and that's a thin place. Feel God's presence. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned those different uh, places where people go in the scripture and they had their private mm -hmm. place where they were praying. I witnessed that as well. And it was very reverent, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I thought about St. Martin while I was there. And, okay. Uh, Eric just shared that when he was in Spain and he went into the churches and that sense of connectedness with St. Martin's and churches and those special places we have to pray. I think if you ever see pictures of Ireland, uh, you see it's, it's a, a very interesting, it's always green, it's called the Green, green Isle because it's very green. Um, but it's rocky, and, it's, and with the ocean coming in and the storms, um, you can understand, I can understand how people were very close to nature there, how very, very close they were, and how it spoke to them. And uh, it's, some, it's something that we often reflect on that in today's world, with our little computers we carry around, so we're never too far from connection with people, and television and, and automobiles and all. We need that, that sense to just slow down. And that's what the Irish people, they were so, so close. And to, to see that, that sense of suffering and pain, and to rejoice because it was a sense of hope. It was a sense of hope. And the dance and that, that beautiful dance that got very popular a few years ago when they, they were running around the country with those uh, great performances, the Lord of the Dance. That, uh, just that, that straight, but those legs just, just going. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts? Well, so what we're gonna do is end with this prayer.
knows? <laughs> this, is all, this is all tradition and myth and all that. But, but Patrick was uh, escaping from the Druids because he had lit the Easter vigil fire. Now, I'd like you to pay attention to a couple things. His sense of trinity and creation. And I, I love the part where he talks about creation itself giving us strength. Now think of this as a morning prayer and the, the, the universality of that. So we will begin with, I think you're number one. Who's number, you're number one. Okay, that's right. You're number one. You're number one. <laughs> For my shield this day, a mighty power, the Holy Trinity, affirming threeness, confessing oneness in the making of all through love. For my shield this day I call, Christ's power in his coming and in his baptizing, Christ's power in his dying on the cross, his arising from the tomb, his ascending, Christ's power in his coming for judgment and ending. My shield this day I call, strong power of the seraphim, with angels obeying and archangels attending, in the glorious company of the holy and risen ones, in the prayers of the fathers, in visions prophetic, in companions apostolic, in the annals of witness, in virginal innocence, to the deeds of the steadfast. For my shield this day, I will call heaven's my I don't have my glasses on. So, moon's whiteness, fire's glory, lightning's softness, wind's wildness, ocean's depth, earth's solidarity, rocks, what? Immobility, thank you. Around me I gather these forces to save my soul and my body from dark power that assail me against false prophesyings, against pagan devisings, against heretical lying, and false gods all around me, against spells cast by women and men, by blacksmiths, by druids, against knowledge unlawful that injures the body, that injures the spirit. By, that they, by strong protector, against poison and burning, against drowning and wounding, through reward wide and plenty, Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ to right of me, Christ to the left of me, Christ in my lying, my sitting, my rising, Christ in heart of all who know me, Christ on tongue of all who meet me, Christ in eye of all who see me, 
Christ in ear. For my shield this day I call a might power, the Holy Trinity, affirming threeness, confessing oneness, and the making of all through love. For to the Lord belongs salvation, and to the Lord belongs salvation, and to Christ belongs salvation. May your salvation, Lord. Now, if you prayed that prayer in the morning, you wouldn't have any fears all day. But I hope you noticed, I hope you noticed how he calls upon the nature, heaven's might, moon's whiteness, fire's glory, lightning's swiftness, wind's wildness, ocean depth, all of those are my shield. They're all here for me. Uh, and then God's strength to direct me. So I think this would be, a wonderful morning prayer. You probably don't need all of it every day, but it's a St. Patrick's breastplate. So thank you all for coming tonight and for sharing with us. And if you have any questions, any questions, comments? All right, thank you very, very much. I have a number of books here if you want to look at any of them.